Okay. Alrighty, hello everyone. Uh, every, everyone that's coming in right now. Uh, welcome to our transfer Q&A. My name is Karen. I am a fourth year psychology major and I am one of the peer academic advisors for the School of Social Sciences. Um, just like all of you, I am also a transfer student. I transferred from uh, Long Beach City College. Uh, during this panel, students will be provided with some quick uh, degree check reminders. And we prepared some panel questions for our PAAs to answer. And in the end, you will all have the opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A chat. Um, if some of the if some of your questions were not answered, um, you are all welcome to ask questions in the Q and A chat throughout the panel. But uh, keep in mind that they will not be answered until the end of the session. Um, please do not write your questions in the regular chat, since that will be used for um, campus links and resources. Um, I will provide more details about that as we go on. Uh, this session will be about an hour and 30 minutes, so we hope that you stay throughout the whole session. Uh, but for right now, we're going to get started with some uh, quick degree check reminders. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. All right. So I know most, not all of you are political science majors since this is a non specific um, transfer session. Um, however, uh, so for the first column, wherever it states, um, I get C right here, um, it just means that those requirements are being covered by your I get C certification since you probably already uh, took those requirements from the community college that you're transferring from. Um, however, I get C does not cover the upper division uh, writing requirement or the school of social science math requirements or the computer uh, technology requirement, which should be down here. Um, also, any of the courses that are filled out in black, such as the top with the little star next to it, it just means that those classes, uh, you already took them before you transferred, and those classes are already completed, so do not enroll in them. And wherever it's marked in red, where it says F20, F20, F20 right here, uh, it just means that you are enrolled in those classes. And also, if you think a course seems familiar or it might be a class that you already taken. Please check with an academic advisor from your course enrollment email. Um, all upper division courses are marked, um, well, are numbered uh, 100 to 199, and lower division courses are numbered 1 through 99. And then 36 of your final 45 units should be completed on campus. However, because of COVID-19, that's probably like an exception. And you must also have a 2.0 GPA overall, a 2.0 in your major, and a 2.0 in your overall upper division courses. And you must have a total of 180 units uh, to graduate. Uh, please keep in mind that, that your units and your university requirements are not um, updated yet, but don't worry, your information is all being processed by the admissions office and registers office, which is going to take some time. And then everything should be updated by the sixth week of fall quarter and your patience, patience is appreciated. Also, uh, please do not forget to send in your IGTC certification. And for those who, who do not have your IGTC completed, um, ask your community colleges or the school you're for you're transferring from for your partial IGTC. Um, you or a counselor should um, be submitting the IGTC certification through our, to our office via email and the Office of Admissions via email. So two different emails. And I will be posting those emails in the regular chat in just a bit. But meanwhile, do any of our PAAs have anything else to say? Yep, okay. All right, so here is the emails in case any of our students need it. There you go. And now we're going to get started with our panel questions, which should be fun. And then, like I said in the end, um, if you do have any questions, we will be answering those at the end. Um, so one moment. Um, okay, so our first question, this is for our transfer Karen, PAs. Can we introduce okay. ourselves first? Oh, yes, go ahead. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Catherine. I'm a fourth year psychology and sociology double and I'm happy to be with here, be here with you all today. Hi 
everyone, I'm Christine. I'm also a fourth year. I'm a double major in psychology and political science, and it's really nice to have you with us. Hi, uh, my name is Christy. I'm a third year double majoring in social policy and public service and education, and it's nice to have all of you here. Hi everyone, my name is Marimar. I'm going to be a fifth year double major in international studies and public health policy. So welcome to UCI. Hi everyone, I'm Olivia. I'm a third year student. I'm double majoring in economics and data science. And welcome to our session. Hi everyone, my name is Sam and I'm majoring in business economics and minoring in art history. Welcome to UCI. Hi everyone, my name's Waylon. I'm a senior and I'm a major or psychology major. Thanks for coming. Was that everyone? You're muted. Yeah, I just saw that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, before we get started with our questions, I did forget to mention what a peer academic advisor is. Uh, so we're all students just like you. Uh, we're taking classes, but we're also helping students because uh, we know how hard it is to transition to a university. Uh, we went through a quarter long training to help students with scheduling classes, general academic questions and academic resources. And our first question is just for our transfer PAAs. And it says, how did you adapt to UCI as a transfer? What did you do and how long did it take you to adjust? Um, so I am a transfer PA. And um, to answer this, um, to adjust to UCI academically because it's a quarter system, it took me about two quarters just because everything is a little fast paced compared to the semester system. Uh, that's why it's recommended that you guys take 12 to 14 units. Also because like everything is remote, so it's completely different from like in-person classes. Um, socially, I think it was a little bit like harder for me uh, because I didn't know anyone. And um, but, however, joining clubs and going out of my way to to talk to my housemates that helped out a lot. Um, I guess for me as a transfer, it was really overwhelming just because I thought that I had an edge over the high schoolers because I'm like, oh, I'm coming from a community college, so I probably shouldn't you know, at transition better than a high schooler. I was kind of wrong in that sense, just because one, we're now in a quarter system, which is way faster. Um, the pace is like, you know, overwhelming at times because you can have like a midterm or a paper due in like the second week. And you're like, oh my gosh, where is this going? And you have like no time to procrastinate because once you procrastinate, you, you're you're abandoned ship, that's it. <laughs> um, so yeah, biggest thing that like to help you academically is like make a planner, try to like um, keep track of all your deadlines, um, you know, make support groups, study groups, whatever you need to do. Um, other than that, I think also just the campus is huge. Once you get on campus, it's like a giant circle, but then you can easily get lost because of how big it is. So honestly, Zot Finder, Google Maps will help you. Even if you end up in the wrong classroom, it's okay. The professors are totally used to it. So it's totally fine if you like get lost every once in a while. Trust me, it took me about two quarters to get used to campus and the quarter and this everything. It, it's a lot. It's like, even though you like, oh, I'm, a uni I'm now in university and I came from community college. I should know what I, what, you know, I should know what I'm doing right at this point. It's fine. You're a new student at, U at UCI. You're transitioning to a whole new lifestyle. Take your time. Take it easy. Don't overload yourself. Just like lower your expectations a little bit. <laughs> Keep make it easy for you. Thank you, Aileen. Um, so our next question is, how did you get involved on campus? Uh, what clubs, organizations are you in and how can students get involved? I guess I'll go again. Um, so first off, big thing, make a Facebook, please, please make a Facebook. That was like the best way to contact all the clubs, the leaders, ask for meeting times, so on and so forth. As to, wait, how are we gonna find out where all these clubs are and what these clubs are about? Um, so we have this 
and Eater Involvement Fair, sorry, um, which is pretty much when they have all these clubs available for you to just talk to and get information about the club, their meeting times and activities. Um, since we can't do it on campus, there is going to be a virtual one. Um, and I'm pretty sure someone has a link somewhere that they can like put while I'm talking. Um, another source that you can look into to find out what clubs are available, we have this amazing site that links all 600 and over uh, clubs and organizations found on campus that you should really check out. I highly recommend at least joining one club in your lifetime. Um, it'll definitely help you socially make connections and help you get yourself involved on campus, especially since we only have like, what, two to three years um, only at UCI. So, and just to advertise, if any of you are interested, I am in Tomonokai, which is a Japanese and Japanese American cultural social club. Um, if you enjoy Japanese culture, no matter who or what race you are, you are free to join. I'm also part of the Ant Eater Student Audio Production Club, which is pretty much audio production and how to make music. Um, I will put both links in the chat, but yeah. <laughs> So like Waylon was talking about, uh, if you look in the chat, I put two uh, links to different websites. Well, they're actually the same website. One is just more specific. It's actually the one for if you want to know more about the virtual ant eater involvement fair, uh, because that'll be held at the end of September. And there's going to be information about that, how to access it, all that sort of stuff. And then the other link, which is like the overall general link for that website, is the one where if you go to it, there's actually, if you scroll down to the bottom, there's like a little box and it says like 600 plus clubs. And if you tap on that, like you click on it, uh, you'll actually be able to go to like a page that you're able to search up any club that you're interested in. And it, it can like, uh, it can be really specific. So if there's like a certain type of club you wanna look for, like maybe sports, you can narrow down your search. So that's like a really good resource to use. Another thing is that if you really wanna get involved, I'd recommend checking your email a lot because a lot of organizations and clubs will send out emails, um, especially if there's like an organization on campus that has like intern positions or something like that, they'll send out emails to you directly. Uh, I was in ASUCI for two years and that's how I found my position was through emails. So definitely check your emails. Yeah, definitely agree with what everything has been said. Um, definitely check your emails. That's how I got involved in like a lot of stuff as well. Um, so honestly, like Waylon said, just join a club, like make your make your first year at UCI, even if it's remote, like just add a little spice into it and add like a club or something that you could enjoy and look forward to. Um, I'm part, aside from a peer academic advisor, I'm also a peer health educator um, at the UCI Center for Student Wellness and Health Promotion. So in that position, you get to learn about different health topics we cover sexual health, um, we cover wellness, emotional well-being, um, nutrition, alcohol and other drugs, body positivity. So it's a bunch of health topics. So if you're interested in any of those things and promoting um, healthy behaviors or just anything remote related to health on campus and to your peers, you should definitely look into the position. Um, applications usually open either beginning of winter quarter or end of fall quarter. So keep an eye out for that on your Facebook and your emails. Um, it's an amazing opportunity where I got to meet a lot of like lifelong friends at the moment. So it's literally so fulfilling. I'll put the link in the chat as well so you could get um, a little more insight about it. Uh, I guess another way to like um, learn more about the, like, the different orgs on campus is to just like get involved in one club and then meet the people in that club who are probably a part of other organizations. I know that's how like I learned a lot about um, the different things that they're on campus because um, the people I met in one club were like in so many other things like I met so many other people and learned about that so I think that's like another way to learn about like how to get involved. <laughs> Um, so I'm part of Foster Student Ambassadors. It's a club dedicated to helping uh, current and former foster youth with transitioning, uh, housing, and food resources that they might need. Um, so yeah. Okay, so next question. Um, tell us about a resource campus or campus resource that you recommend most. Uh, what resource should transfer students take advantage of? Okay, 
Um, I really recommend SARC. So I did intern there last year and I keep using it even up to now this year, like over the summer, even though I'm not like interning there anymore. So as a student and as a former intern, I know that there are just so many resources that a lot of students like pass by, like actually a lot of students graduate and then some even come back to the resource center and they're like, can you help me with my resume? Can you help me with my cover letter? Um, I'm pretty sure you guys might have heard of it by now, but SARC is basically the Social Science Academic Resource Center, and we're really special because we're like the school that has that center, especially for us. Um, they don't deny other students from other schools, but like it's made for like social science students specifically. There's a whole lot of things that they can help you with, like they help you with your resume, cover letter, CV, graduate school um, information, graduate school application, if you're interested in research. They can also help you hit up those research opportunities. Um, they also help you with your career path a little bit if you're interested. We even have a whole internship database like made and ready by, um, and those interns, internships listed on the website have already been previously, um, um, have been basically like an internship for someone else like for a UCI student before. So they have been like responsive, those companies. And besides that, they even have like an opportunity for social science students to get um, academic unit credit for some of the internships that they have, even if it's like outside of campus. So yeah, there's like a lot of things you can look at. Um, I would say like the courses in UCI really help you develop different types of skills, but they don't really help you apply it to like your career choice after you graduate. So during this time in UCI, you guys should also be focusing on that kind of development too, because when you go into the workforce, like you're not gonna know how to like talk to people as much or like do the writing that you need to do or like use the skills that you've learned from college if you haven't applied it at some point as well, I feel like. So um, yeah, Sark is really good at that. And I can put the link down in the chat box if you're interested. So, I mean, for me, I Sark is amazing by the way, definitely check it out. I did an appointment during the summer they were great. They helped me talk about graduate school and what to do and so on and so forth. It's great. Um, honestly, another source I would like to advocate for is the Division of Career Pathways. As transfers, we only have about two to three years. So we're going to be in the force very, very soon. And we're probably really like, oh my gosh, how do I get a job? What kind of jobs are there? What kind of opportunities are available for me? And how do I get these jobs? Well, that's what this source is for. Um, pretty much they help with job and internships. They show all the opportunities and postings. Um, they help you with tools and support, such as for me, I took advantage of their, what was it, their resume workshop, which is pretty much going through your resume, making sure it looks clean and organized and professional so it stands out above the rest. I also took um, advantage of their mock interviews, which is pretty much sitting down, um, them asking you questions, that's probably what they're going to ask anyways at the actual interview, and then giving advice on what to say or anything that like might speak to them, like your posture, how you dress, so on and so forth. And that really helped me get a job. If I'm honest, I wouldn't have this position as a PAA if I didn't have the Division of Career Pathways because they were the ones that told me, hey, you're, inter you're um, interested in academic advising and there's this position called a peer academic advisor you can totally try out for and we can totally help you get that position. So honestly, I wouldn't have this job without them. So thank the Lord. <laughs> um, but yeah, I definitely recommend you check it out, make an appointment, talk to a counselor, not counselor, talk to one of the staff there. They're amazing. They're super awesome. Definitely check it out. I'll send a link below. Um, another great resource for transfer students, uh, there's this thing called the Transfer Student Hub which consists of like other programs within it. So for example, there's the first year transfer experience program. Uh, they provide workshops, large scholarships, so you guys don't have to pay for tutoring, book loans, discounting printing. Um, then there's also the transfer triumph program. So in case you're struggling or you're on academic probation, this program is like willing to help you. And just to quickly mention, um, if you were a former current foster youth, apply to the FIRE program. Um, it doesn't matter what age you are in the foster care system, they are willing to help you, unlike community colleges who only accept students who are in the foster care system after the age of 16. Um, UCI is so unique and you have a lot of programs to help you out. 
I also want to talk about the Writing Center. It's a resource that I've used before as well. And since everything is remote at the moment, you could actually book a Zoom appointment or email consultations, which I've used um, the email consultations and when I used to go in person. So they literally help you like on scholarship applications or like um, any writing papers that you may have. So I know for sure I might use it just because I am taking my upper dip writing this quarter. So I definitely recommend that. They give a lot of tips on grammar. They give a lot of tips on like how to make your content so definitely look into that as well. Um, I do want to mention that things do get packed really fast just because a lot of people request it. So maybe look into like appointments a little early if you already know a due date or something and draft those um, papers so you could send them to them. Oh, and I put the link in the chat. A little too early, but it's there. Uh, I just quickly want to mention, um, please utilize your um, forms of communication with your TAs and your professor. So that way, um, like both TAs and professors are both beacons of information, like questions about the course, questions about like how to get to grad school for the TAs or even the professors or like their research. Seriously, they are um, so full of information and so willing to help you. So don't be afraid and just reach out, send that email, um, attend that Zoom office hour and uh, yeah, and it will get too far because Especially right now, I feel like some people tend to not. So if you go in now, they might be more likely to remember you maybe. So yeah, try that out. Uh, yeah, like Catherine said, definitely go to office hours. Not only are you getting help for your course, but you're also networking, which means that you, know, you could get a letter of rec in case you're interested in going to grad school. Okay, we'll move along to our next question. So you recently experienced remote learning at UCI, which is on a quarter system. Tell us about your experiences and best advice. So a lot of your lectures will be pre-recorded, um, but there will be some live lectures. So make sure before um, the school like quarter officially starts that you make, um, make sure you look at the course syllabus for each um, course that you enrolled in. So the course syllabus is just basically in Canva, like Canvas, like you just click on like each link like to your course. And then if the professor has uploaded the course syllabus on there by then, it's really good to just look at it early because it'll probably let you know if it's pre-recorded or live. Um, and just keep in mind that a lot of the pre-recorded lectures, if you do have those, then don't expect it to be posted or released like the day or the time that you signed up for that lecture itself. Because at least in spring quarter, a lot of my professors um, released it like even a week later <laughs> or at, at least like a couple of days later. Like I think it's really rare if they even posted the day of, maybe like one time, but it's just because they're also getting used to Zoom too. And they also have a lot on their plate that they personally have to do. Like some are still having to do their own research. They still have to write papers and articles, you know, and it's just like, it's hard to have to all of a sudden go from an in-person lecture to like all this technology, especially to people who aren't technologically advanced like me. So yeah, make sure you give your professor space, give your TA space, give your instructor space, give faculty space, give everyone space, give yourself space. Um, also, yeah, the days tend to blur together personally for me because it's just, we're quarantined, like we're just sitting in a house, you know, I'm sitting in a house and I don't go anywhere anymore. I used to like study a lot, just like moving around because it helped me kind of keep track of like the hour, I guess, kind of made me a busybody. But now that I just sit here, it's just hard to keep myself motivated sometimes. Like I have to do this right now. I have to do this like later. So like keeping a planner is pretty useful. I'm just writing dates ahead of time and keep track of your emails because during the remote session, like a lot of the professors have been sending emails to remind the students like you have a midterm coming up or I released a lecture. So you might want to check that out now. So yeah, emails are like more important than ever because the professor either speaks to you through lecture or through an email. So make sure you keep track of those. Uh, like like Christine said, you know, keeping a schedule or a planner is, is like really helpful and useful. I use um, Google Calendar, which I love just because it has all the colors. I can color coordinate my schedule, but I don't have to write it. I can just put it online. Um, and then also, you know, your mental health is always really important, but I think that it's especially important during a remote quarter um, to, and to be aware of it, you know, because for me, like 
remote learning was really difficult and I didn't realize how much it was affecting my mental health until, you know, the quarter was almost done and I was only doing classes. I wasn't reaching out to anybody. I wasn't talking to my professors. So just be like, you know, just be aware of how it's affecting you and make sure that you're taking care of yourself. I uh, highly recommend breaks between classes. You don't always have to do schoolwork. I know sometimes it feels like that, especially when you're at home and you may not be able to go out and see people so you feel like you constantly need to do work but that is not the case you know definitely try to take breaks do something that you enjoy I really liked reading and I obviously I still do but um, I kind of stopped you know during school just because you get really busy doing everything else and seeing all these people so if there's maybe like a hobby or something that you've kind of forgotten or you're not able to do as much before you know quarantine maybe take this time to kind of find it again uh, just do things that make you happy like make sure that you are taking care of yourself that is so important that should be your priority uh, during this remote quarter besides you know your work they go hand in hand but mental health is super important <laughs> Honestly, I agree with like everyone here. Definitely take breaks. Zoom burnout is real. You will burn out at some point if you sit at your computer for hours on end. Take a break. Like like me, I'll like either get up and I'll start like moving and dancing or I'll like watch anime or something just to get my mind off of like school, school, work, paper, midterm, you know, stuff like that. Um, another thing is key communication please talk like we're at most of us are at home or we have a roommate or so on and so forth and obviously they're gonna at some point come to your door and they're gonna be like hey it's um you can you do chores or hey can you play with me hey can we play animal crossing now you need to tell them i got school you need to dedicate those days to i literally have to work please do not bother me i i can't i don't bother me <laughs> right because honestly, if I start playing like Animal Crossing, I'm going to be there for five hours. I'm not getting up. <laughs> um, yeah, I think another thing that I think someone already mentioned the planner. I also do that too. Please do that. Um, other than the planner, I also do phone alarms and little support groups. So like, for example, my phone will at a certain time tell me, hey, are you on Twitter right now? You should probably get off Twitter, <laughs> um, which most of the time I'll be like, oh, shoot, puts my phone down. I start working. Another thing, support groups, I get my friends and they are the ones telling me to get off my phone <laughs> because they'll see I'm online and they'll tell me to get off <laughs> at certain periods of the Day, which I totally recommend because when your friends tell you to do it, you're more inclined to do it. <laughs> um, I would say, um, even though we're all online, definitely still take advantage of office hours. They're still there. Teachers and TAs are still there to help you. Other than emails, office hours are great. Just book a Zoom appointment and do it. And even though like they take forever sometimes, you know, trying to email you back or get a reply, just remember we're all online. We're all learning on this new platform. And now they're being bombarded with emails from students and staff and faculty. So they'll answer you. Just let them take their time to answer you back. They're still here to help you. Um, I just really want to. <laughs> so something recently happened today. So I have a little cautionary tale for you all. I'm not one for spontaneity, so I would like to, um, I think it's beneficial for me to plan out my breaks. Cause if I don't plan out my breaks, I just take a break all the time and for long periods of time. And then I don't go back to my work. So this week I am feeling all the repercussions of not planning out breaks. I am very stressed out. So don't do that to yourself. Please avoid doing that to yourself. Take the breaks, they're so important but make sure you are also like not forgetting your obligations because then it's all gonna pile up, especially right now, week five, summer session two, I don't know if anyone else is feeling the same way where it's like everything is going on at once. So don't let that happen to you, please. I'm begging you, plan out your breaks, plan out your schoolwork. Um, like was already previously said, they go hand in hand and they really do, they connect so heavily to each other. So um, don't let it all pile up but then also don't um, not take breaks. So take breaks, but be careful. So yeah. I have a short, oh, you go first. Oh, I'm sorry, Olivia. Yeah, I have a very short one to add. Um, yeah, some of you, some people realize like when you enroll into courses um, before your quarter begins, you're going to realize that even though discussion enrollment is mandatory, if that discussion is offered for the course, a lot of your, I mean, I don't know if a lot, but some of your professors and instructors won't make it mandatory to go to discussion. Like enrolling to discussion is mandatory, 
for your course enrollment, but sometimes your discussion itself isn't mandatory. But I would highly suggest you guys go anyway to discussions that aren't mandatory, like even though it's remote. And I know how you feel, just kind of like, what if no one shows up to like the online discussion? Like, do I just have to like stare at my professor and we're just kind of talking it out like by ourselves? Like, yeah, maybe it'll happen, but that's kind of a good opportunity for you too, because you have the TA and like your professor instructor all to yourself. And like, you can ask like all these questions and get to know them. But most of the time, like there is one or two students that are there with you. So don't worry about it. It's pretty rare if there's only like one student in the discussion, I feel like personally for me. I just say this because before like a midterm starts, like a quiz starts or like, I mean, not before they start, but before they begin, like a little before they're about to like, you know, start along the way or a final, they give you like a study guide or like they give you good hints like, oh, maybe this will be like important on the exam or like maybe this is like good to know, you know, wink, wink. Even if it's not coming up, they just say like random stuff during the discussion like, oh, this looks pretty important, you know, I would keep that in mind and then yeah you write that down if they say that you write that down okay and it's like really useful because one time there was like an essay question for me like on the exam but we didn't know like what the question was going to be obviously they just tell you like the format of the exam itself but like before like even even though it wasn't like near the midterm exam time like I was at discussion and the professor was just like this sounds useful to like write about or like something like it's important so I kept note of it and I studied and it was on the exam, so you guys would benefit from going. Um, I want to mention, like, um, like Willis said, there are a lot of distractions during remote learning. Like for me, when I said I want to stay for an hour, I actually did look at the books for 10 minutes and on Instagram and Twitter for 15 minutes. It's like my everyday life. So for me, I'm forcing myself not to look at the phones. Like I have two apps. Uh, one is Flora, one is Forest that like keep myself not touching the phone or the cheese will be killed or something. So yeah, this is the way like I keep like get away from distractions. And another thing I want to mention is to check syllabus like before the classes and make sure about the classes exam styles. Um, like are your are your exams are gonna be monitored or not monitored, like open notes or not open book. Because if, a, if the professor is going to monitor your exams or quizzes, they're going to ask you to open the camera and open the microphone. So if you don't have a like, computer camera, you need to get one before the class starts. So you really would need to make sure about that. Because like, during my summer session course, our professor asked us to do that. And some, some students are like, I don't have that. But yeah, it's quite confusing and they have a lot of trouble. So please make sure beforehand. Um, so I guess like, uh, as a lot of the PAAs mentioned, uh, mental health to prioritize that. Um, so I just wanted to like, uh, with advertise or yeah, talk about like the counseling center. Um, I utilize their services, like even before this whole like remote situation happened and I feel like it really got like the ball rolling for me to like take care of myself better so I'll like drop that link in the chat and then also um like all the other resources that were mentioned previously they're also open and they're all here for you so please take advantage of them uh virtually while you're learning yeah I just wanted to mention like please be patient with yourself like this is a whole new chapter in your life so like just be patient like when you study best when you work best the environment you're in you know because I know for me when I started in zoom and coming back home um, for spring quarter was definitely a big change after all these years at UCI so I definitely had to be patient with myself like know when was the best times for me to work which usually were late at night if I'm gonna be honest but you know just finding that environment where I could be more concentrated so definitely be patient like Sam said like use Google Calendar I use that as well you get to get like a visual of your whole week or day and you get to see where you could like have breaks where you could chat with a friend do hobbies etc remember you have these resources on campus even if they're remote you still have these resources for you um, as Christy mentioned like it's super important the counseling center us like you have all of us so please use them and um, we're here for you Alrighty, so moving on to our next panel question. 
Uh, for our PAs who dorm or live near UCI, how do you commute around campus? Uh, what were some advantages and disadvantages? So I've lived on campus uh, both of my two years at UCI, and my main form of transportation was our Anteater Express. I can drop the link down below, um, which is basically the bus that is for UCI students. It goes all around our little like UCI area, and it hits most uh, sections of campus as well as the housing communities associated with UCI. So that is my that was my main form of transportation. It is free for students, so that's really nice. You don't have to worry about paying or showing some form of identification before you get on. You can just use it. Uh, I also just walked, you know. I didn't live that far from campus. It was only about a 15 to maybe 20 minute at the longest uh, walk to campus and I got used to walking it was really fun especially since the weather in Irvine is usually really really nice like it's rarely bad weather down there uh, so yeah I just kind of walked a lot and I would say an advantage about living on campus was definitely just the proximity to the school itself uh, I had like, you know, you feel, I had like more of a community in my opinion, just because there was more people who were going to school, like I was living with people. And I know that is definitely going to be different uh, for this quarter, this remote quarter, but I'm still, I'm going back still. So I am excited just to go back and at least see some people uh, from a distance, social distancing. And I also really like that, like I said, the proximity, like just, I could go to campus whenever I wanted. It was right there. I would go sometimes uh, early in the morning or late at night, just because it was really pretty, like it's so peaceful, especially when there's not as many people on campus. So that was definitely an advantage in my opinion. So yeah, like Samantha said, we have the Ant Eater Express. Um, so like I stayed at Camino and um, I would get like the Ant Eater Express and like I had like lots of groceries. Um, there's like an Albertsons nearby. So I would just like hop on and then come back. Um, also like, from Camino to like campus, depending on how fast you walk, it could be like a 15 to 25 minute walk to campus. Um, so I would get the Ant Eater Express as well. And just like Samantha also said, you don't have to show your ID or pay, you just hop on. For the Ant Eater, oh, sorry, Christine. <laughs> For the Anteater Express, there's also an app that you could use to check the times will pass by. Um, so I use that a lot just so I won't be waiting for too long or just I miss it by like a few minutes. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat for that as well. Um, so you could have it. Um, you could just input UCI and then it'll give you all the times they'll be running and then like what type of routes they'll be taking and the stops they'll be stopping at just so you could be a little more aware and like have more info on that. Yeah, if you don't want to keep looking at the at the schedule though, once you get used to it, like or what line that you're going to be using frequently, you can always download the Rider app. Basically, it's really useful because it's just um, based around the Anteater Express. It tells you like what lines, like current, like when you open it, currently are running, or like the stops it's going to stop exactly at, or like the if you're at a stop, it'll tell you like how many minutes approximately it'll take for that bus to reach like your stop. So it's really useful, especially during night classes, because um, after my night class was over, like, I had to like wait for the bus to like take me back to housing. Um, it took longer. So sometimes I even had to wait like 20 minutes or even a little bit longer. if They had to like switch between like the, the drivers and stuff and they had to wait for the next driver. So like, I think it just makes people a little bit anxious. Like I was a little anxious without the rider app at first, like during those times at night, because I was like, is the bus coming? Like, am I, am I just like the only one not going home today? Because it just sometimes takes a little while, you know? So it's really useful to have. Um, yeah, when everyone else is worried, you could be worry-free if you just have this app. Um, you could go in. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll go. On. It's just about the Ant Eater Express. Um, so all on campus uh, routes, they will be in service. However, the ones that go off campus, like the one that goes to West Irvine, Diamond Jamboree, and Irvine Spectrum, uh, those will be not in service. So just because I didn't really hear anyone talk about commuting from home, um, I commute from home. <laughs> um, it's about a 15 to 30 minute drive depending on traffic, which is one thing that I definitely wanna emphasize. If you are commuting from home and let's say you have specific classes during the day or during unfortunately heavy traffic hours, you have to plan your schedule so you're able to get there on time. I definitely recommend going there earlier 
just because like for example I had like a 9 a.m class and I had to like get there at around maybe 8 30 a.m just to make sure that no there was like no traffic no accident in front of me that was gonna you know make sure I didn't get to class or get there late so definitely recommend doing that um another honestly a disadvantage of commuting from home is that with that when you're always driving back and forth from school to home from school to home and even if you have work at the same time pray for your soul my gosh um it can get really exhausting fast because you're going to be in a car all day using gas like yikes um for me even just going to a club at like 6 p.m at that point i'm like dead tired i'm like i've been driving all day i want to go home it's so no but honestly the club is worth it just because that social interaction it's great you need that after driving all day um definitely recommend still going to that club it's going to be like a burden at first but i trust me it's worth it um also i'm not too familiar with it because i don't park at uci but parking is expensive so if you do plan on bringing a good car and parking at uci good luck <laughs> Um, maybe someone has more information on that, but yeah, it's a lot of money. I think it's actually going to be free this quarter. Um, they sent an email recently, so if you are planning on bringing a car, this is a good quarter to do it, you know? So yeah, perks. It's oh, free. Oh, go ahead. It's free until January uh, 3rd, I believe. Yeah. Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> Um, I do also want to say, even though the Ant Eater Express isn't like avail like available to go to this place as of right now, once it opens for this line, definitely check out Diamond Jamboree. It is the best. It is the best place to like get boba, to get um taiyaki, which is like a fish custard ice cream thing. It's great. Um, there's also what what is it? A karaoke room, an escape room. Definitely go. It's amazing. Okay, and our last uh, panel question. Um, how can students get involved in research? Are any of our PAs involved in research? Um, so yeah, I've been, I was involved in research this past year and then I'm going to be involved this um, upcoming year. So this past year, I was in a year long research series, part of the program in public health. So I learned about like research ethics. We had guest speakers kind of talk about um, like conducting their own independent projects. And then in the winter, we were assigned to a mentor. So I was assigned to a faculty mentor. She was a professor in the Chicano Latino department and the program in public health. Um, so I learned a lot from her. I was working with her in the anti-soil lead project which was based in Santa Ana so they kind of uncover like lead exposure and like to help reduce the um, health risk it imposes on the community um, so I learned so much about it that and like a, environmental health environmental justice so it really uncovered like a new passion of mine um, it was definitely an amazing opportunity for me to learn outside of the classroom work with a professor professor one-on-one -on -one and then meet with her um she got to know me on a like a personal note and like i even asked her to be my mentor this upcoming year again um for the um public health um, research honors program so this is also a year-long program that i'll be part of so i'll be be able to conduct my own independent study and then under her guidance and then i'll be able to write an honors thesis throughout the year so it's definitely i would definitely recommend research just because um, it's an amazing opportunity to get to know your professor, um, definitely to learn outside of the classroom, as I mentioned, uncover new passions, um, you know, unleash your curiosity. Um, so I definitely recommend that just because it's really cool. I've been learning so much and like, it's really cool getting to know a faculty mentor, someone you look up to so much on a personal note. Um, also, it's very beneficial if like you were to go to grad school and you want a letter of rec. That's also very cool as well. So yeah. UCI is a research university, so most of your TAs and professors are conducting research anyway. So they would love to talk about it. They love students, you know, who ask about it. So definitely, if you're interested, you could use office hours for that as well. 
Uh, so at UCI, we have a program called the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program. Uh, it's basically a program to help students who are interested in research. Um, so right now they're hosting events online in case you have like any questions regarding research. Uh, if you go to their website, they have like a huge list of on and off um, campus research opportunities. Um, there's also the research, the student research interest form. So basically it's a form where you fill out, um, you talk about yourself, your research interests and your goals. And then once you submit it, a research counselor will contact you via email to make an appointment and see what she will do from there. I'm not, um, just a heads up. Uh, I don't know if some people don't know this, but you don't have to do research. Um, I mean, for me, I don't do research just because I have too much on my plate right now and I can't handle it. But if you do want to do research, good for you. That's great. It's going to look great on resumes, going to have great recommendations, let recommendation letters. There we go. Um, but yeah, that is amazing that you want to do that. Another thing that I want to mention is that there's no specific, oh, what psychology um, research can I do or what sociology uh, research can I do? There's no such thing as that. Research is meant for your interests and what you like and what you want to go into. Um, I think Marty Mar talked about something about lead exposure and looking into that, which is honestly really cool. But again, look into the faculty profile system, look into the Europe, find out what you're interested in, what they're going into, and then it's like, bam, look at all these opportunities you can take advantage of. I definitely recommend it, even though I'm not in it. I, a lot of my friends did it and they tell me great things about it. So yeah, like Waylon mentioned, uh, there's also the faculty profile system. Uh, basically, it's a, a system where you find professors and their research interests um, and, if they're, and if they have any labs. Um, and if you, they do have any labs or your interest, research interests are like similar, like you could always email them, uh, say like, hey, are you recruiting people? So on and so on. Uh, that's another useful um, site. So you guys could like, you know, if you're interested in research. And also, if you're interested in research, but you're not sure what kind of topic you might be interested in, you just want to like, like look around for options, you know, and like just kind of immerse yourself and just kind of like get to know these topics that are possible and out there better. Um, you can always go into like Karen mentioned the faculty search. I hope and someone please link that down below as I talk about it. Or I could do it a little later. But basically if you just click on that link, it'll take you to the website and you would just put in like School of Social Sciences or wherever you're interested in browsing, you know, about the topics that have been researched already. And then just put in like like a subject, like if it's social sciences, put in like political science, if you're interested in something related to that, and then click the search button and it will give you like a whole list of professors um, in that field, like who are doing research like about political science, the one we're using as an example right now. It'll have their contact information, like their email or and their name and everything. But if you want like a deeper look into what research they actually did and you want to read about it, you could always just go into Google and type in their name and then UCI at the end for like research or something some professors have their own website um dedicated to them and um basically like yeah it has like all their research on there like maybe some aren't like maybe you can't read all of it but for the most part you should be able to see a lot of documents and before you talk to a professor about it don't worry if you feel like you can't understand the document or like the research you should not be able to understand it like 100 percent because if you do you were on your way to PhD school. <laughs> I mean, because even a professor told me once, like, I mean, if you understood all of that, I'd be really, like, surprised. Like, it's just so, like, complicated. Like, I read a paper once, and it's just, like, so difficult. So if you're interested, though, just, like, read through the introduction, read through a little bit of, like, the document to get, like, a good understanding of that, at least, to know what you'd be getting yourself into, you know, if you're, like, actually investing in it. And then just email the professor, like Karen said, like, oh, hello, I read your research paper. It was very interesting. Would you mind meeting up with me to talk a little bit more about it? Um, this is my email address, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, you just send it to them. And if they respond back, like, yeah, you can meet me at office hours and we'll talk about it. You could go and talk about it. And then after, be like, do you like have space at your lab currently? I would really like to join. And don't be really sad or disappointed if you can't get in. Like, I was interested in research before and I really like this professor that I was talking to. So I want to get in so badly, but there was just no one because there's even like a wait list sometimes like some people like 
are like to professors, hey, can you like let me know if like a spot is released? So like you're already on like a wait list, you know? So it's kind of crazy. So yeah, um, some people just get in automatically and some people just like have to wait like such a long time or they can't find it for so long. So don't worry, like it just really depends by professor. It's not really like based on qualification or something like that. Just like sometimes it just because there's no space. Alrighty, so we have finally reached the end where we will be answering all of your questions that were written in the Q&A chat. Uh, we will be answering your questions out loud on a chronological basis. The regular chat will be used for links and resources. The Q&A chat is the little button at the bottom of your Zoom where it says Q&A. Um, however, we can't answer questions regarding your housing and financial aid application since that is out of our expertise. But we'll try our best to answer those questions if they happen to appear, um, maybe like recommend you a link or someone. Uh, we can answer questions about our housing experiences or recommendations though. Um, if you have any questions that pertain to you specifically, uh, like a test score or a specific class, then email and academic advisor. So let's get started. Waylon and Olivia. I guess I'll go first. So our first question is, I had a question about financial aid. Not sure how the portal works. It says on my award that I can accept a loan or decline if I well, if I do decline the loan, does that mean I pay that amount before I start the quarter or after? I am also a transfer student. I feel like it would depend maybe on like if it's an unsubsidized loan or a subsidized loan. But like I would recommend going and asking like a financial need a financial aid. I don't know if anyone else has like any feedback. Um, this is very like not official in any way, so please do not quote me if you ever talk to someone. So um, I, the people that I know that don't take out their loans and they do decline them, um, I believe they, the amount shows up on their um, SOD account, is that what it's called? Where you pay your fees. So I don't know if you have access to that for your account. Um, if you are planning on Declining, everything is taking a while to update. So I would say um, don't immediately look for it. If you like submit or like accept your award in whatever fashion. Um, but I also have contact with the financial aid office and they got to me, got back to me a month later because they are super swamped. And um, like previously said, there's just a lot going on because no one's in the office. Like people are taking the remote, like the phone calls remotely, the emails are being like, um, approached as like they come in as fast as they can so um, I would say just be patient you can always email them um, September is like tomorrow so um, I would say definitely try to reach out sooner than later um, I don't have any like further information but I believe if you do decline it it would show up on your Zot account but I'm not 100% sure that's just what I've heard based on like what people have told me for like their financial situation. Um, so yeah, I can get to the um, link and I'll share it, so. Are we all good for that question? Anyone else? Okay, so next is, how do I know once I have made it off the wait list? What are my chances of getting in the class? Um, honestly, it depends on the class. Um, for me, in my experience, you have to be pretty high up on the wait list to be considered if you're probably maybe getting into the class. Um, I remember being like ninth on a, in a class on the wait list and unfortunately I didn't get in and only like the first three to five people got in unfortunately. But again, it depends on the class. Maybe they have, they'll make more space just because we're online. I have no idea, but I, I, would, I would say if, you do have a waitlist class definitely try to also enroll in another backup class in case you don't get into that waitlist um, I also would recommend maybe emailing the professor like for example for a summer course um, I, I literally went to the professor and I said hi so I'm blank on the waitlist and I was wondering if you're gonna open more spots and what are my chances of getting in usually your professor will email you 
and they'll tell you probably the chances based on the past like past summers or past courses if you're probably going to get in that wait list and whether to get your hopes up um doesn't mean you can't but i mean again it depends if anyone else has their own intake on that in my personal experience um yeah my it really does depend on like who you have as your instructor your professor but you should be pretty high up on the wait list like maybe like at least top five or like you know, max top five, because if you think about it, people enroll into these courses after a lot of consideration, usually, you know, because, um, you know, enrollment window and all that stuff after your, after your enrollment window is like time is done, then you have to wait until like everyone's done, you know, basically. So it's just kind of like everyone's pretty, usually pretty committed to the course. So even if like one to three people drop out, like, I think that that would be around like normal. Like, I don't, I didn't really have a course where a lot of people dropped out, honestly, because the professors would sometimes say at like the end of lecture, sometimes like in the first few weeks, like we're still considering like um, spaces for the people on the wait list. So just please like keep doing like the homework and the assignments for now. Like that's kind of the drill until like the professors are just kind of like, OK, like we definitely don't have like space. No one's going to drop out. And it's just too late for like people to catch up like with all the work potentially or like, you know, that kind of stuff. So like Waylon said, just make sure you have a backup class that you're willing to take as like a GE that you really need or like it's a different class that will fulfill one of your major requirements or it's a class that will be able to replace the one that you're waitlisted on. Yeah, I just, I do. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just to quickly add on, uh, if you are waitlisted for a class right now and you do have a backup, make sure that you are enrolled in that backup because you do have to be in 12 units to be considered a full-time student. Uh, so if that class does not work out, you need to make sure that you're still enrolled in, you know, 12 units. So just make sure you're enrolled in classes right now. Yeah, I was just going to say the exact same thing. Like, <laughs> just make sure you're enrolled in 12 units at least and then a waitlist class um, just to make sure you are a full-time student at the moment. If you get off the waitlist, they will email you that you are in the class. Um, you could also check your, your space, like, for example, waitlist number five on WebRidge as well. So you could keep an eye out. And I, I want to add one more thing. I, uh, I, had a, I had a very unsuccessful experience. Like the class size is probably 30 people in that class. And I was on the second place in the first day of the class. And until the like week two, Friday, 5 p.m., I'm still on the second place. <laughs> like nobody ever draw from that class. So I didn't get into it. Really. So I want to say it's very, very hard to predict your chance because um, there's a, because, because it's, I think it's out of luck or something. So um, yeah, definitely got your backup backup plans and classes on your schedule and don't like, yeah, don't like me, please. <laughs> um, this is also kind of like a PSA, but please make sure that your fees are paid by September 15th um, because that's once that deadline hits and your fees aren't paid for, then you lose your spots in all your classes. So like, that's very, very unfortunate. Please don't let that happen to you. But if you're on a wait list, that could be a potential if you had someone in that class, they didn't pay their fees and they get dropped and then, yeah. So more so just do it for yourself, um, but it's like kind of a small opportunity if somebody didn't pay, then, you might um, get like, um, yeah, you understand. <laughs> Okay, so we're moving on to the next one. I think this is for Whaler, right? <laughs> what is the Disney Club or a Disney course? I heard my name. Hold on, I got this. Hold on, hold on, I got this. He's a real okay. expert now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first off, Disneyland Club. Unfortunately, we don't have a Disneyland Club. Cries, sad face, I know. But UCI does have a Disneyland course. It's called Art History 55. And pretty much, I think it covers two requirements, GE requirements. So that would be Art and Humanities, as well as Science and Technology. 
Now, the Disneyland course, I'm gonna have my nice Disney TED talk here, but pretty much it's all about the mechanics behind Disneyland, the theming behind Disneyland, why did Walt Disney make Disneyland, what's Disneyland all about, so on and so forth. Like we'll talk about the Dole Whip, <laughs> um, we'll also talk about, what else? Um, the trains behind Disneyland, like the trains were like the big thing in Disneyland. You're going to talk about Matterhorn, all the different rides. Um, you're going to talk about what kind of tracks they use, so on and so forth. It's amazing. It's fun. It's awesome. I will warn you, though, it's a lot. Like this course is worth five credits, not four, five. And again, it covers two GE requirements. So you got a bunch of reading to do. Um, you got discussions every week. Um, you also have three mini analysis papers and a final project. The three analysis papers are pretty much um, a vlog analysis. How does vlogs, you know, describe Disneyland? Um, I, I know there's two more. I know there's one on Matterhorn, and then there's one I can't remember, but it's Disneyland related. Um, the last final project is based on what design a ride and based on all the information you learned. Um, incorporate it and design your own ride. Where would it go? Um, what kind of track you would use, the theming, so on and so forth. I made an Aladdin ride and I got a great grade on that. Um, honestly though, if you love Disneyland and you're motivated, the readings are like nothing. They're I like, I will like gladly read 20 to 30 pages just to like read more about Disneyland and how amazing it is. It really makes you appreciate Walt Disney and all that he's done. So, so like, you know, since way before time because Disneyland is never ever done. It's never completed, it's always growing. Even talks about the new Star Wars land and the new Millennium Falcon and that other ride that I forgot it's called, I'm so sorry. But if you wanna take it, um, it's, it gets really full fast. Um, during the summer, I, it's way less, um, you know, there's more open spots, but it's a lot more crowded and overwhelming because you have two classes in one week because it's only five weeks, not 10 weeks. But I mean, if you do have time and you have the motivation like me to take the course, I definitely recommend it because Disneyland is great and it's such a fun course to just, you know, be involved in. Um, so she has actually another question regarding the Disneyland course, um, yeah. all, the, all at the bottom, um, she, or she or he, um, in regards to the requirements it fulfills, I can take it for the computer requirement? So it's for the science and technology and the arts and humanities. Unfortunately, it's not for the community, computer, sorry, computer. And if you are a transfer student and you already have those requirements filled, well, those, that five credits will actually be applied towards your graduation because remember you need 180 credits to graduate so if you do end up taking you're like oh but i don't want to waste it because why am i taking this course because i already did these requirements of ge's well i mean if you do take it again it'll count towards your graduation so <laughs> if you really enjoy it i would say yes um, just to quickly add on to the computer requirement question. So it depends on your major. It might either be ICS 31, uh, SOC Sci 3A, or Psych 114M if you're a, a psychology major. Okay, so we're moving on to the next one. Um, do we have to get our shots for this quarter even though we're not, we're attending classes remotely? Um, I want to say yes. Yes, you do. Uh, they recently sent all of, I don't know if they sent incoming students' this email yet, but they sent, at least I got one, and it talked about like the immuni immunization records and all that sort of stuff. And basically, you must get your flu shot no matter where you're living. And if you're an incoming student, you will have additional uh, shots and like, medical records that you must provide. So they're probably going, they should have, they should be sending you an email soon about that. So I would look out for that. But yes, you will, you will have to get the shots um, that the school requires you, even if you're living remotely from campus. I was looking at the website for the Student Health Center and it said all incoming students and then in parentheses said all in caps. So I'm going to say yes, all incoming students have to get um, 
their flu shot and then send it in. And then if you don't know how to do that, there's also a bunch of um, like steps that I, in the link that I put in the chat. So if you don't know how to upload your um, record, then um, see that for sure. Okay, um, so the next one is, is there, is there a place for transfer students to go so we can get feedback or help with the ad plan for future quarters? Um, so if you're, if you're wondering like how to kind of like, are you, are you talking about kind of like, a, um, what's it called? Like a schedule, like an academic schedule, like your, your schedule, your list of classes or actually, I'm not even a transfer student. Maybe a transfer student would be better equipped. <laughs> um, I mean, I would just say, uh, your the academic advisors, uh, us. You know, we can help you. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's probably that's that's definitely advice I would give too. Because um, I know, like, even I'm not transferred or anything, but when I came in as my first year, I came in as a first year. Even after my, you know, first two quarters, I was still really struggling with figuring out kind of what sort of path I wanted to be on. Um, and I just felt really behind and I didn't really know what classes I still wanted to take, but I definitely used um, my academic advisors. I would go in and I would just say like, hey, um, I'm really struggling right now. I don't know exactly what class I wanna do. Um, can you help me? And of course they're willing to help you. Like it does not matter what year you are, they will go in. If you go in, they're there to help you. Like that is exactly what they're there for. So um, that's definitely, yeah, use, utilize your academic advisors. Also, I know Wayland talked about the division of career pathways earlier on in the session. That was another thing that I really utilized uh, just to see how on track I was for kind of like maybe jobs that I was considering or career opportunities that I wanted to further pursue. Uh, so that's definitely another resource to use um, later on, you know, in future quarters or even this quarter. Okay, so we're moving on to the next one. How do you recommend we find support groups? A semester, even being in person with my peers and professors, I feel kind of isolated towards the end of the semester and in a half term course where we never met in person. Being new and transfers, what kind of tips would you offer for breaking the ice, seeming friendly even behind the screen? Um, okay, I'll, I'll go first. I go. Um, I think like um, like in the first class, there will probably have a meeting or even there's not a meeting, there's a um, page on Canvas that people can chat to each other. And in our class, we, we, we have a group on both Discord and on Messenger. So we can have like a group of most of the class uh, classmates in that group and we can discuss lots of um, class release stuff or other things. And yeah, I think people can meet in, in the group chats. Uh, I would also say, don't be afraid to reach out in the discussion section of your Canvas course page. Yeah, um, because during like when the quarter starts, you're going to have a Canvas page where all of like, where your classes will be. Like, okay, so there's an overall Canvas. Well, you guys use Swap, so you probably know how like the Canvas page works. Um, but that's where all of your classes are going to be. And there's like always a little discussion tab on one side and a lot of students like I actually saw this during my summer session was students would just kind of like uh, make posts they would just say hey like does anybody want to go over the homework uh, is anybody want to talk about like this one subject and they put like their email or something. Uh, so just, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. There's always going to be somebody who, you know, feels the same way or they were thinking that and they were just too afraid to reach out. I know that's been me. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm kind of worried about putting, you know, myself out there. But I think that's actually a really good way to kind of meet new people, especially in this remote quarter when you're not able to see them in person, when you're not actually able to go to discussion or lecture and see them and like make that connection. Uh, so yeah, definitely don't be afraid to just, you know, say something in the discussion group chat. I also highly recommend joining clubs because most of the clubs on campus are going to be active this quarter and they definitely want new members. Um, so if you're able to like definitely utilize that because they're still going to hold virtual events and that's still a way to meet people online. And then when you go back to campus, you already have, you know, a group of people. So definitely get into clubs. Personally, for me, just because I was a transfer, when I first came in, I was like lost and I'm like, I know nobody here. Uh, <laughs> so honestly, I think the best thing you can really do is one, uh, study groups. 
Um, I think for me, I think Canvas is a great way to find people. And a lot of the times, um, a lot of the professors will actually put on the side, oh, um, here are some questions or things that you can say. And then there, there'll be people that are like, hey, I'm making a support group or I need, or I want to make a support group. Is there anyone there? And a lot of the times, that's where a lot of where I started talking to people. Like, um, I think a lot of the time it's mostly through Facebook. Um, some will make some personal app stuff. I don't know um, exactly what they're called, but that's one thing. Clubs, definitely recommend. Clubs is a huge thing. Please join clubs. That's honestly the best support group you're going to get. I think another place that you could go, um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to um, go there often, but I have heard the Transfer Hub is really good just to like get information and talk and like, you know, meet other transfers there, um, which hopefully someone already linked below. I have no idea if someone has, but those are honestly the, be the best advice I could give as to how to be involved and to kind of like be social at UCI, especially during online stuff. And yes, still please join clubs, even though we're all online. Like for my clubs, it's either Facebook, Zoom, or Discord. We still have game nights. We still are doing chats. So yeah, support group. <laughs> I did want to emphasize the Facebook as well, because you could join like your class pages and they post also like study groups or stuff like that. Um, you could join clubs through there as well, just so you could be in the loop of what's going on at UCI. They have some funny memes on there, UCI related memes. So definitely, um, you know, make a Facebook, um, be in the loop, just get to know like your campus community a little bit because people are always posting on there like every day. So, you know, join your class page. Um, and yeah, so for tips on being friendly behind a screen, I know professors and like, you know, if you do join club meetings, they do appreciate if your camera's on, um, they like seeing your beautiful faces. So definitely do that. Um, but yeah, if you're able and comfortable with that, of course. So are we, uh, are we good? Can we move on? Good? Okay. Um, if you do not park at ECI, where do you usually park? <laughs> um, I don't drive and I don't park anywhere. However, according to Reddit, um, it's really hard not to park at ECI just because like around, like just everywhere, like you need like a permit, like even at the UTC, you're going to need, uh, I believe like a permit, because if not, you'll get a ticket. If you try to drive where, if you try to drive, if you try to park where like Target is or stuff like that, you know, if the security guard sees that you're going to campus and coming back, you know, you'll get ticket. If you go to like the other housing area, that's like in the back of Camino, that's a pretty long walk. But um, yeah, you still need a permit. You need a permit everywhere not just at UCI, like around the area. So that sucks. Um, so you can't get away with free parking. <laughs> but hey, it's free now, so. Uh, I just want to mention also read the permits. <laughs> not all the permits apply for each parking area. So they really get you. So if you're going to park in a certain area, make sure you get a parking permit for like lot, whatever, or like parking structure, whatever. Because if it's not correct, you will get a ticket, you can get towed. If you live in like Stanford Court, my roommate kept getting towed. So make sure you have your permits in check, your fees paid, just please. Because the, also the um, towing company they use, if you get ever get towed, try not to. But um, it's all the way, like it's like a half an hour drive where they take your car. And so not only do they take your car, but you have to have someone take you to go get your car. And then it's like a $200 fee to like get your car out of the, the lot. So definitely avoid at all costs. Um, it's not fun for anyone involved, you know, cause you feel bad for your roommate. And then like, if you have stuff to do and you can't take them, it's not, a, it's a lose lose. Please pay your fees, check your permits, make sure all that stuff is in order. Anyone else? I'll say one thing, yeah, okay. you'd be surprised, like, in the areas surrounding UCI, like, even Target, and there's, like, a little place, like, a little bit, just, like, a tad bit further from, like, our main campus area, there's, like, a, there's, like, a burger place, like, called Habit, 
and there's a Starbucks in this little area and they literally have in the parking like no UCI parking, no UCI parking, no UCI parking, no UCI parking. Like you'll find that a lot around the UCI campus. <laughs> no matter how far you think like you're from campus, like you will find one of those <laughs> no UCI parking because I think a lot of students tried to get away with it back in the day. So just imagine how much students have tried that they have to put no UCI parking <laughs> everywhere around. Um, yeah, I think um, one time my friend um, accidentally, he didn't even mean to, like he accidentally left it at UTC for like a club meeting and the meeting ran late. And then he came back and he got a ticket or he was about to get a ticket. Yeah, he was about to get a ticket. And then the guy was really nice actually. And I guess he said like, okay, next time, like make sure it's really not, but then he got to take it anyways next time because he kept forgetting, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, make sure you don't forget, like keep track of the times, especially if there's like a time limit in like that parking space, like in UTC or something, like make sure you keep that time. Um, also, yeah, make sure you renew, if you're going to park in the ACC home parking lots, then make sure um, you buy your permit like each quarter because like a new form comes out near the end of each quarter and asking like, oh, do you, do you want to purchase like a permit for like the following quarter and you have to renew it in order to be able to keep your park, like your car parked there. You'd be surprised how many students probably forget like to renew their permit before like the quarter begins. And imagine starting your quarter with like a ticket. That's so sad. So don't do that to yourself. Write it down on your planner. Write it, memorize it somewhere, okay, religiously so you don't have to pay so much money. Okay, are we all good? Cool. So um, there is one question that Nya Beck did ask, but we didn't really get to it. We just went on and on about support groups. Um, it's more towards me and Karen, but they said, being a new and transfer student, what kind of tips would you offer for breaking the ice or seeming friendly even behind a screen? Um, honestly, I think if you're, if you like suddenly say on Facebook, hey, I'm taking this class, is anyone else taking the class? You're gonna have people saying, oh, no, me, me, wanna make support groups, so on and so forth or reach out just talk to people if you see just like a slight maybe interest that they're into you can just come in saying hey I also like this um and they just talk about it like for example I'm wearing a Disneyland uh Jasmine headband so then now I just gave information that people can talk to me about Disney and Aladdin for like who knows how long um honestly that's the best icebreaker I can think of or just talk to people get to know them that's the best way to really seem friendly <laughs> but yeah i think that's good enough we'll just go on to the next question um there is an 18 unit restriction currently will it get lifted after september 1st yes i'll send the link for the quarterly calendar so you can know other uh, dates as well for like restrictions or like when class schedule comes up. So it's really helpful. I'll send it in the chat. There you go. <laughs> uh, next, I'm currently confused on which class to add to complete the 12 units. Can I email you guys for guidance? Yes, <laughs> totally. Um, I'm pretty sure Cam is going to um, send everyone the links as to um, our email and how to contact us and so on and so forth. Um, other than that, um, I think you should have gotten an email from an academic advisor of your degree work or degree check, um, which is pretty much saying which courses you need in order to fulfill your major and to graduate. So that's a good place to look. You can also look at the, uh, the schedule of classes to find which classes are available, what you can take, so on and so forth. But yeah, you can totally also just email us. We're like so welcome to help you. And if there's a certain advisor or a certain major you wanna ask um, a person of, like, oh, I'm only, I'm a psychology major, I'm a sociology major, and I, if you wanna say I prefer asking this type of major, that is totally fine. We are totally cool with that. Uh, okay, I think we go on to the next question. Uh, before the first day of the quarter, does the class appear on Canvas or do we receive an email to inform us about the class information? How does that work? Um, I'll just do this briefly because I feel like other people need to talk other than me. <laughs> but most of the time, 
Canvas will show up at least a few days before the class actually starts. At least that's my experience. Like I'll see, oh, it showed up on Saturday before the Monday. And I'm like, oh, I can, and I'm already getting like emails from my professor saying, oh, hey, welcome to the class. Sometimes they'll send a syllabus and then they'll tell you what's going on and what's up and what to do to prepare for class, which is really helpful. That's my experience. If anyone else wants to Yeah, there's not like a specific like date that the instructors and professors upload the course material or make like the Canvas page available for their course. It just depends on every professor and instructor. From my experience, the people who do use that website, they usually post it like a week or so in advance or at least a couple of days in advance. And it's like open for us to just like browse through and get like a gist of like what the heck's gonna go on in this class. Um, and then as Waylon already mentioned like really well, the professors and instructors will also usually, like they typically do email you like about like the class saying, hello, my name is blah, 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 thanks for joining the class. Here you'll find like course syllabus. If you click on this page and this page, if you prepare it with something, something, like if it's a live, I don't know. And then if it's a pre-recorded lecture, they might be like, um, I'll be releasing, you know, this day or something like that. Just something informative about like the course to let you know, you know, school's gonna start soon, so <laughs> let's hop to it. Um, yeah. So just keep an eye out for that. I would say at least like a week before course, like the quarter is officially gonna start like the instruction, I would keep looking through your emails just in case there should be something. I just wanna quickly mention, um, check your spam folder if you feel like you aren't getting anything from your professors. Cause sometimes depending on how your email is set up, um, a lot of like some stuff will go to your spam folder. It's not often, I mean, for me at least, but like, if you're like, wow, class is like tomorrow and I haven't gotten anything, check your spam folder. Um, and if the professor hasn't uploaded a Canvas page, they will usually email you saying like, it's not up yet, sorry, see you tomorrow. Like really brief. If they just like, you know, they just tell you how it is and it's great because you don't want some like fluffy answer, at least I don't. I just want to know, do I have an assignment or not? So yeah, <laughs> okay, bye. I want to quickly mention that if you're in a Willis class, um, then you are not going to have the course page on your canvas. So if you want to have the materials for the course, you need to email the professor. Yeah, like, or you will like get a list of the class. Anyone want to add? Okay, we're moving on to the next one. Um, regarding to books and the bookstore here at the Big New Campus, where should we look to get our textbooks and how early should we be purchasing them? Um, so we do have a main bookstore on campus, uh, but that does not have to be your primary source of like, you know, buying textbooks. It can be easy to kind of like, find textbooks because they do have something where you can like match the class that you're in to the textbooks you'll need. But the most reliable answer for any textbook is definitely the professor itself. Um, and I don't recommend buying any textbooks before the start of the class just because sometimes you don't need the textbook. Like it'll even say in the syllabus, you need this textbook. And then the professor will say during class, actually you don't like, you don't need to get it. And those textbooks can be really expensive. Um, so yeah, my best advice is just to wait until like that first day of class, or if you're really worried, email the professor beforehand and ask specifically about textbooks and which edition they recommend. Um, but another good way to find cheaper textbooks is Facebook because a lot of students do sell their copies of their textbooks or Amazon because you can rent or buy used and those are usually much cheaper than brand new copies. I do want to mention that once you, um, you know, once the professor says what book you do need, um, definitely get on that as soon as you can, just because they can run out or the prices could really go up really fast. So please, like, once you know that information, go on your search and find all the books you need. Sometimes you won't need any, which is amazing, and sometimes you'll need some for every class. So definitely um, just make sure you attend class. I usually wait till my first lecture. Um, I've always done that, honestly. Like, I just wait till my first lecture and see what they say. Um, so I'll definitely recommend that, too. So you don't want to buy the wrong edition or just, you know, spend money when you didn't have to, you know? Um, very non-officially, not, like, professionally recommended. You can always look for PDFs 
online. Um, just please be very cautious, like use all your knowledge of like using the internet and like judge accordingly to like sources. Please don't download shady links, you know, the lock in the corner, just, you know how the internet goes, just be aware of that. Um, I know on Twitter, at least like, because most students are going to be remote, there are a lot of like um, PDFs circulating. So like, if that's something that you're able to find, cool, like save those links, share them with your classmates. Everyone will appreciate it, I promise you. So um, also just be aware like edition wise, because it could look the same in the beginning, but change. So um, PDFs are always a good place to start, but be cautious and um, just make sure it's the right book. anyone else is like me, you know, and they're curious, like, what kind of book, at least, like, the professor or instructor might ask you to buy, you can always go on to um, UCI Hillside website. Um, there should be, like, a search textbook section, and if you put in, like, the, like, the quarter that you're interested in looking for the book for, the, um, what was it, the course name and the course code, and you just click enter, it'll tell you, like, all the required textbooks, and then just, like, the textbooks that are like recommended but you know unless you're like really interested in that like don't buy the recommended like you don't need it for um the course okay so don't buy a recommended book unless you're just personally interested in reading more about it or something um yeah because i've been doing that this whole time and basically um it's worked out fine for me i really do recommend like the other said that you wait though to buy the textbook um after you've had like your first lecture with the person because they usually tell you like specific editions and stuff like that. And although people might think like editions aren't that important, like there's some changes in there that are really, really, really important and that might be on your exam. So please get the right edition, even if like the older edition is or like some other edition is cheaper. Please don't buy that book because it's not going to help you in the long run. And you're paying a lot of money for just like the course itself. So just pay a little more or like be willing to search around a little more to get the right edition. So they're not the same at all. Um, and if they are similar enough, your professor will tell you whether or not it's okay. And then sometimes they'll provide the other page number, like they'll do that. That's, I've only had that happen twice where they are actually willing to like put the page numbers for you. So um, yeah, they'll usually tell you. And re regarding the, recommend the recommended stuff, they will seriously recommend you like eye clickers, which Clearly no one will be needing currently. I don't think that's how that works. Um, notebooks, like especially moleskin notebooks that are super expensive. Honestly, like please don't, unless you want those things, but don't think you're required to have any of the like, sometimes they'll like recommend pencil. It's super, the algorithm is weird. Um, just don't spend money you don't need to, save up. And um, like everyone said, contact your professor if you have questions. So I just want to chip in really quickly. We are at the two minute mark. So if you do have any final questions, please, please Q&A right now before it's too late. Or you can also contact us, which uh, Karen, I think this is a good time to end the <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, so if you guys look at the regular chat, I put our peer advising email and our regular uh, socks in case you do have questions about, you know, your classes or what class a little to learn more about us and I also added once again the transfer um, email and the office of admissions email uh, to submit your IGETC certification. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say it's going back to that one question we had earlier about the 18 units restriction lifting um, so our wonderful uh, academic advisor Stella actually added on to that too which is that you know we highly recommend that you only take 12 units this first quarter just because it's such a transition you know like even starting um, a new school and doing it remotely uh, and you don't want to like overwhelm yourself with too many units because you have you know uh, five other quarters if you spend two more years here um, to you know, take more than 12 units to do 18 units. So just definitely, you know, pace yourselves this first quarter. Don't uh, overwhelm, overwork yourselves. So just make sure that you're taking care of yourself and not doing too much. So, yeah. We got one more question. Okay. So um, our last one is, how is the counseling center? Is it helpful if you are a person that stresses out easily? Yes. 
already yes like i've been there a few times and they're like so helpful i mean take advantage of this resource because you can go to a therapist and they cost hundreds of dollars for one appointment um here it's free and like i mean why who doesn't like free plus i mean if you do stress easily they are really helpful to just either a lend a listening ear you know or to just give you the advice as to help you and find out what you should do in order to help you like you know some good relaxation techniques or tell you some things or maybe like make a plan or so on and so forth they're really helpful so i do recommend going there because they are not utilized enough and mental health is totally important i don't know if christy wants to chip in on this <laughs> Um, no, yeah, they're super helpful. Um, and they also have, like, they hold workshops. I'm pretty sure you can probably find the calendar on their website. Uh, but, like, since we're running out of time, I won't try to look it up. But, like, uh, you can, like, browse their website and see all the different things they have. Be short and simple. Like, just think about it. You are everything on campus, everything available to you from campus, everything that UCI offers, you literally somehow pay for it. Like, it's part of the money you provide to the school. So it's just kind of like, I mean, just think of it kind of like you already paid for it and like it's there for you to use. So why not use it, you know? Everything on campus, I can assure you, like the resources here, even the counseling center, like everything is just so useful and just so well-maintained. Everyone in these fields, like in these separate fields, they're just so like knowledgeable and I'm very impressed like every time I visit these centers they're just so kind and they know what they're talking about and they're really there for their students no matter what field it is so yeah take advantage of all of them well it is 2 32 and we have no more questions so thank you guys everyone for joining our transfer Q&A uh, we appreciate you all for staying this long so have a good good luck in your first quarter. You guys can do it. We believe in you.